this is kind of the final uh, checkpoint that we'll say that everyone goes through to really build confidence and capability, ensure that it's in place, and that's what we call live simulations. We will essentially bring in professional actors to play the role of the patients, but in terms of the care team, we'll have the actual physicians, nurses, technicians, health administrators providing the care. So it really gives us a chance to fine-tune the performance of the facility before there's real patients. The focus of the simulations were on the, primarily the, the emergency department. The ED that they were moving out of uh, was very small, very cramped. They were shoulder to shoulder. A lot of the communications were based on visual access and verbal communication. When they moved to the new facility, they would no longer have one centralized station. They'd be moving to uh, four decentralized nurse stations. Much more efficient, much more modern, longer distances to travel to get supplies, and they were going to rely on technology a whole lot more. So it was a big change of practice for them, huge change of behavior. We listed at the very beginning of the projects what we wanted to get out of it. We knew that we had to deliver patient care without missing a beat. You know, on opening day, there was no time to, uh, to stumble. And, uh, that was exactly the, uh, the value of the uh, simulations. I'm going to go grab some more of that pain medicine. Are you feeling any better? The simulations were new to us. We've never had a, a, an opportunity to build scenarios and practice uh, our ER care and processes to this magnitude. Ready? Bang, he's scoped and pedal With real actors and real scenarios and a way to mimic this environment in the same context that we've been doing in our everyday life. The development of the patient scenarios was a very joint effort. We worked with the physicians, we worked with all the nurses, charge nurses, clinical specialists and trainers. They would take from memory situations or medical situations, cases and, and client experiences that they had had. We had some intoxicated combative patients that came into the unit that had to be restrained and have security get involved. We had some stroke patients, we had some patients that came in after accidents. Your actors were all fabulous because I thought, oh, are you got a joke in actors? You know, how much is that costing? And um, but they were so real. So when you first come in, you know, they're My name is Nick Edwards. I'll be playing an intoxicated combative patient who um, comes in through uh, EMS and has to be restrained. I don't think you could have done it without the professional actors. Them being very involved in their roles and really playing things out and giving us the verbal cues that uh, patients normally would. No breathing? No breathing? Uh, she's having uh, abdominal pain, left knee pain. We involved the EMS and first responders of the community. So everybody had a chance to simulate. It's a very integrated service within the hospital. So uh, it wasn't just the emergency department. So that first day when I was handed the script, I had no idea what to expect. I could have looked at that timeline forever and not known what to expect until we actually did the first simulation. And I'm going to have my gloves on. Let me go get gloves. <laughs> we don't have gloves. And then from there, it was a mess. But we learned so much, things that we hadn't even thought of. Because you can either see people being moved into the room or you're the nurse. I mean, something simple and basic, we didn't have phone numbers for people. The communication piece of it, we didn't know how to use a call system. We didn't know how to page overhead. So, for 29. so staff assist, overhead page, staff assist to 20. Placement of mirrors and how long it takes to call an elevator in an emergent situation. Those type of things we couldn't have found out without simulations. When there's a code in the unit and it needs to be heard overhead so people can respond in a timely manner, uh, some of the volumes were dialed in when the space was, un was not occupied. And once you get the buzz of the, of the environment going and all the people in the facility, it's obviously audibly louder and no one can hear those codes. It's not, nothing about testing the clinical competence. Uh, we didn't make it that. When you work in an environment like that, uh, you really rely on habit or um, what you know and you don't even think about where you reach to get a supply or where you walk to quickly to get a cart. Every day there was something that we learned that we would bring up and that staff would bring up. Are we going to have any portable uh, yeah. heavy trays or not? We'll yeah. still have all those in the supply room. Okay. The, the integration of the comments from staff because of course all along MBBJ was able to 
garner comments from the participants and then take those and integrate those into changes made for the subsequent sessions. Uh, that was absolutely essential. It let us kind of have a trial run and who wouldn't want a trial run before you actually go live? It's best case scenario. You get to try everything out before you actually have to use it. I would say that simulations are absolutely an essential piece, the core uh, around which we built the ability to bring staff here and have them have success in this space, to interact with people that they knew weren't truly sick, but that they had to treat with all of that seriousness. Looking at it as a whole, um, you know, again, I would hate to think of, of the first approach, which is just pick a day and move in. We, we would have collapsed. I mean, it, it could not have happened. One of my colleagues says uh, after his first shift, it was the best shift he's ever had. So uh, I think that says a lot. A beat. I mean, they took care of the patients in the space as though um, they were very, very familiar with the space. So, in other words, it all worked. It all just, um, it worked.